All right, so today I'm going to tell you about um, a technology that's been developed at, I have to stay here. I'm used to wandering. Um, a technology that's been developed at uh, UCSB um, and JPL with uh, mostly NASA funding. It's a collaborative effort. Can I go forward with this? Okay, there we go. It's mostly a collaborative effort um, between my group at UCSB, where I'm a professor in the physics department. I have uh, six graduate students and um, a couple postdocs. Here, is a, here we are at the uh, telescope. We also have uh, JPL, which makes our devices, and uh, we have teams at Oxford and Fermilab who are building instruments based on our technology. So the, the name of our technology is called the Microwave Kinetic Inductance Detector. It is a uh, NASA-funded detector, which we'll go into the details of how it works on the next slides, but it's a superconducting detector technology with operating temperatures below one Kelvin. So these, uh, the, the semiconductor detectors we've heard about so far are limited by the fact that they work through the photoelectric effect. A photon comes in, it knocks an electron out, you get essentially one free charge carrier. In a superconductor, the gap energy of the superconductor is about 10,000 times lower. It's like one, it's 0.1 milli electron volts instead of um, one electron volt. So when every photon comes in, you don't get one free carrier, you get five or 10,000. And that, um, that enables a, a quantitatively new regime where you can do much more than you can with a semiconductor detector. So what we can do is we can make single photon counting optical, near infrared, and all the way up to x-ray, in, including the UV, detectors with microsecond time resolution. So we can count when every photon comes in to a microsecond or better. And we can also resolve the energy of every photon. So when a photon comes in, we absorb it, and we can tell you uh, its energy to roughly 10% in the current generation detectors. We have no read noise or dark current. These detectors, it's very hard to deposit between one and four EV of energy into a given pixel without being a photon. Um, for instance, a cosmic ray will light up our whole array, and we can do a time veto. So we can, we can nearly perfectly eliminate um, cosmic rays, and we have no equivalent to read noise or dark current. And these are scalable to large arrays. We think megapixel scale arrays are doable. I have to get used to this time delay between uh, hitting the button. Okay, so pixel for pixel, um, MKIDs are the most capable UVOIR detector available. And I will uh, take any arguments on that rather bold statement, but I think it's true. And I'll, I'll hopefully we'll show it to you here. So the next slide. So this is uh, the MKID equivalent circuit. What an MKID really is at its fu most fundamental is, a, is an LC oscillator tuned to work in the four to eight gigahertz range. That's where the microwave comes from. It refers to the, mic the readout frequency of the, of the uh, detector. So that, um, so that detector, um, so this little LC oscillator right here has a, um, an inductor and a capacitor. So what this does is uh, give you essentially a little notch filter, and this, this capacitor couples it into the, um, into the environment. So the, the net effect is that you have a, um, a photo variable inductor, and if we can go to the, I don't know if, it's very slow. Okay, so here is, um, so the point, we, what we do is we make this little LC oscillator out of a superconductor. Um, and so we can make a very high Q resonance circuit with loss Qs on the order of over a million. But we use a, a coupling capacitor to strongly couple it to the environment to give us a, a Q resonator Q of about 25,000. And then when a photon hits the inductor, it causes the inductance to change through a phenomenon called the kinetic inductance effect. And this change in inductance um, we, is measured by sending a microwave probe signal through the device, past the device. On resonance, most of the power gets transmitted back um, to, uh, gets reflected. But when a photon comes in, it changes uh, the um, inductance, and then the, the microwave probe signal can pass back. So, um, what we see if we look at the power transmitted past the device as a function of frequency is a little dip that looks like a notch filter. And this is at base temperature. The dotted line is at an elevated temperature, so the, which is the equivalent of uh, a photon breaking the Cooper pairs in the superconductor. So there's a phase and amplitude change that are um, related to the, um, uh, the energy of the photon. So when the, that photon comes in and hits this inductor, what you get is a 
uh, we sit around at some baseline value of the phase of this transmitted signal, and a photon comes in and we see a quick change and then a decay back to our baseline on a time scale of roughly 50 microseconds, which is defined by the material parameters. Uh, so what we can do here is we can measure the arrival time of this photon by um, where, the, um, where the pulse came in, and we can measure the energy of the photon by essentially measuring the pulse height. A blue photon will give a, a, high, a big pulse, a red photon will give a, um, a small pulse. So we have intrinsic energy resolution on every photon. And the key point about the MKIDS is that unlike some of the other superconductor, superconducting detector technologies that have been around for 15 or 20 years, MKIDS are extremely easy to multiplex. So each resonator is its, has its own intrinsic resonant frequency, and then we can tune each detector to have a slightly different frequency in lithography. You can think about this as pipes in a pipe organ. Each one has its own specific um, length, which gives it its own resonant frequency. So they don't interfere with each other. So what we can do is send a comb of frequencies in that we generate in our room temperature electronics, one, one probe tone for, in the comb for every uh, pixel in our detector, and then we use uh, some sophisticated room temperature electronics to read out that, um, that, um, uh, that, that ensemble of tones. And that lets us do this, um, uh, find the arrival time and the uh, energy of, the, of every uh, photon that hits the array. The nice thing is that working at these gigahertz frequencies, we can multiplex something like, we, do, we currently do 2,000 pixels per wire. Um, going down to the focal plane. And this is what's going to let us hit these megapixel scales with this type of array. Um, when we uh, put these, well, what we can do here is, for instance, put in um, lasers at multiple wavelengths to calibrate the device. So this isn't one of our highest energy resolution devices, but here we're putting in a laser at 4,000, 7,000, and 9,000 angstroms. Each one uh, has a mon each each wave laser gives you a monochromatic, monochromatic response. So you can see this broadband photo absorption uh, with energy resolution across a wide range of energies. So this is what our MKID pixel looks like, um, and we can show that there is a correspondence between this device and um, and the resonant circuit. So the first thing you'll see as we go through this is that. Um, we have a coupling capacitor, so we have a microwave feed line which brings our signal down to our device. Um, and then uh, that uh, signal, um, there's, a, there's a parallel plate coupling capacitor which determines how strongly the resonator interacts with the uh, environment. Um, finally, there's, a, um, there's this large interdigitated capacitor here. That's the capacitor here. That's large to reduce one of the noise sources in our system. And we also have a, um, uh, the inductive section, which is right here. Uh, this inductive section is the place that we're photosensitive. You'll notice that that's not covering a ton of, um, uh, that inductor is not covering a ton of real estate on the detector. So what we do is we use a square microlens array, which has something like a 92% effective optical fill factor. And, um, we um, concentrate the light down into a small spot on this, on this pixel, and that gives us that uh, effectively very high fill factor. The plate scale here is about 200 microns per pixel. That's, uh, that's sort of our comfortable range, anywhere between one and 300 is, is a very natural scale. So these pixels are large, but it, uh, that actually works well with, with the large telescopes that we're working on. Uh, it actually makes the optics of the uh, for the cameras significantly easier than with the small pixels. Uh, on, on conventional CCDs. So here's an example of one of our arrays. This is a 2,000 pixel array. This is not 2,000 by 2,000. It's 44 by 46 pixels, so 2,000 pixels. It has two microwave feed lines. And um, you can see that a as we zoom into the array, this is where we bring the microwave signal in, and then there's this microwave transmission line that snakes back and forth. Every pixel has a slightly different capacitor to give it a, its own resonant frequency. There's um, a lot of fabrication effort uh, and, and trial and error has gone into the microwave design of this device. We have, um, for instance, this, this is a bare silicon right here, the darker color. This is the niobium, which forms our ground plane. Then we have the tinitride film of the MKID, which is sort of a golden color. And then we have these gold bond pads. There's also SiO2 crossovers here uh, to, to, 
to get a good ground plane. So there's been a lot of work and a lot of trial and error that's gone into designing of this array because there's really nothing like it out there. Um, and this is one of our individual pixel designs. So we've now uh, graduated on to, uh, 2, 000, to a 10,000 pixel array design. This, is, this uh, has uh, five feed lines and um, will be uh, used in uh, several instruments that we have been funded to construct in our lab. So we've been, we've been uh, funded by um, the NSF to build an instrument called Darkness at Palomar, which is used for coronagraphic planet finding, which Seth is gonna talk about in the second half of the talk. Um, we've been funded by uh, the Japanese um, to build an instrument called MEC, which is a, a clone of darkness for the Skexao chronograph at Subaru. This is another planet finder. And finally, we were funded uh, recently by NASA to build the imager, the imager for the Picture C uh, balloon. So these will be going on a, uh, on a balloon in around 2019. So here is um, just an example of some of the data we took with the MKIDS. This was taken at the Palomar 200-inch telescope. We did, um, a po we did um, pointings on a six by six grid and imaged uh, ARP 147, which is an interacting galaxy. Up here you see the HST image, so we're not gonna do as well as them because we have the atmosphere in the way. Um, but we can uh, see that we're recovering most of the gross features like this you know, nucleus being offset and this arm, the spiral arm here puffing out and this dust lane right here. But we made all the colors with this, not through narrowband filters, but just using the built-in spectroscopy that the MKIDS provide. So we've made a lot of progress, uh, a lot of it in the last couple years, going from, bare, from not having a functioning detector technology to now having an instrument deployed for 34 observing nights and science papers published um, on, uh, with, on observations from the detectors. And now we've, we've been funded to build uh, three new instruments that promise uh, even more impressive results. I'm calling the technology level three to four. If you were talking about for ground-based instruments, it would probably be TRL-7. But um, for space applications, um, it's probably TRL-3. So um, we've, we've, we've been thinking hard about using these in space, and uh, one of the um, ideas we had was we proposed to the SALSO concept about a year ago um, to use the second NRO optic. And the idea was to combine two technologies um, to greatly enhance what, what you can do. And so we combined our MKID technology with, um, with a solar electric propulsion system to put us into an orbit that gets outside the zodiacal dust background. By combining those two effects, we could effectively increase our sensitivity to something like 500 times greater than HST with the same size optic. This is a really impressive um, improvement. Um, this uh, technology was going to, uh, requires uh, both our, our MKIDs to be functional, but also uh, the solar electric propulsion to put it in an orbit past Mars. So this, this brought, was a cross-cutting technology that took in quite a bit of, um, um, uh, of technology, both from astrophysics and from planetary science and from uh, the human side for the uh, solar electric propulsion. Um, so this is a, just a slide showing some of the things that, uh, that this faux instrument mission um, would be able to uh, accomplish. But I'm gonna move on um, to um, this last slide, and that is that there are a significant number of other potential applications. MKIDs really excel when every photon matters, and um, they're useful for things like satellite-based reconnaissance, X-ray beamline studies, um, semiconductor process debugging, um, laser communications and quantum key distribution, as well as uh, biological fret imaging, anything where you have a hard time turning up your light source. For instance, on the beamline, if you turn, we, that we make X-ray versions too. So these are all um, applications that, we're, uh, that, that really are um, uh, interesting and, and cutting edge and difficult to do with MKIDS. So I'll turn it over to Seth to talk about the other applications. All right, thank you, Ben. Uh, so obviously there are many very exciting applications for MKIDS in, uh, across many fields, but especially in astrophysics, I'm gonna talk about the one that we're most interested in uh, that is very applicable to NASA specifically and, uh, and that we are uh, focusing on the most right now in our lab, and that's the direct imaging of exoplanets. So this image that I'm showing here 
uh, was not taken with MKIDS. This is one of the earliest uh, directly imaged planet systems, HR8799. Uh, you can see the uh, central star here has been masked out to reveal four faint companions orbiting around it. Uh, and the interesting uh, thing about this image is that it's still fairly representative of uh, the current state of this field. Uh, so all of these planets are kind of five to 10 Jupiter mass in size, and they're orbiting at a distance uh, outside of the, the orbit of Saturn around our star. So uh, there's still uh, a lot of room for technology to continue improving this field. You know, this is from 2010, so it's a little old now, uh, but all ground-based surveys that are going on now are still kind of looking at uh, systems in this scale, so large planets that are fairly far out. And as the technology progresses, it'll continue to push in to look for planets closer to the host star and down to fainter and fainter targets. So with all this headroom for new technology, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of space for MKIDS to really have a major impact. And uh, this has recently been recognized in the 2013 uh, NASA Astrophysics Roadmap, where they were called out as a potentially game-changing capability. And that's what I'm going to uh, try and convince you of today. Uh, so first, uh, I need to talk about the uh, current major limitations to doing these kinds of observations. Uh, and to do that, I need to start with introducing how they're made. Uh, luckily, uh, chronographs were introduced earlier today, so I can breeze through this slide pretty easily. Uh, you start here at the end, where you uh, collect the light in your telescope pupil. Uh, you focus it down with a lens to create an image of your star, which you can then block out with some kind of opaque mask, just a black spot in the simplest uh, schematic. Uh, you recollimate the beam with the lens uh, to go back to your pupil plane where you see the residual diffracted light that has gone around your occulting spot, which you can then block out with a secondary stop. So when you form your final image, you've now blocked out a significant fraction of the light um, down to, you know, 10, you know, uh, to, to the scale where you want to be able to image Earth, so you need something like a, you know, 10 billion contrast to, to get to those levels, so. Uh, but of course, uh, these simulations are all shown with perfect optics in a perfect world, and in reality, there's aberrations on all of these optics and on these masks and uh, from your wavefront incoming. So instead of a nice image, what you get is this characteristic speckle pattern from the scattered light that uh, gets outside of your control region. Uh, and the uh, extra annoying thing about this speckle pattern is that it uh, changes with the different wavelengths that you look at it, and uh, it also changes in time. But it not only changes in time, different speckles can change on different time scales. Some are very slow, relatively static, and others can change on time scales less, less than a second. But the most problematic ones are ones that have coherence times of about one second. So these are too slow to let them average away with long integrations, but they're too fast to control with current detector technology uh, that you would use for your science camera. So to, uh, to track and correct these speckles uh, as completely as possible, what you really need is a detector uh, in your science plane with energy resolution, uh, some photon counting or very high time resolution, uh, and no extra dark current or read noise. And of course, these are all the key characteristics of MKIDS that Ben just introduced earlier. So. Um, so we've been funded to build several instruments to, uh, to try and demonstrate the, uh, the potential of using MKIDS to do this very difficult measurement. Uh, the first of which is known as darkness. Uh, it's a 10,000 pixel array, uh, which is uh, being built for integration at the Palomar Observatory behind the Project 1640 chronograph and behind the upcoming Stellar Double chronograph. Uh, it'll operate at uh, wavelengths slightly bluer than uh, most current uh, direct imaging surveys. Uh, and it's designed as just a drop-in replacement for the uh, current imaging camera that they're using uh, behind those chronographs. So uh, darkness exists in the lab, as you can see here. Uh, it's undergoing final integration, getting ready for its first cool-down and, uh, and device testing. Uh, and we expect to be on sky with it in about a year to really start taking data and uh, testing the performance. So once we're on sky, how do we expect it to do? Uh, this, uh, this plot is showing the typical figure of merit for these types of instruments, which is on the y-axis the contrast that you can achieve um, uh, plotted in these units as the, uh, the planet brightness over the star brightness. So uh, 
lower down, you know, bigger negative numbers is better contrast. And uh, you want to know how you're going to do as a function of how far away from the host star you're looking. Uh, so this black curve is, um, is the simulated performance behind Project 1640, just the raw chronographic performance uh, that, that they can get with their uh, current chronograph architecture. Uh, and this green curve is uh, the performance that they, the simulated performance of 1640 after the post-processing that's available to them now. And uh, this curve actually matches very well with uh, their current on-sky performance. Uh, in their recent paper where they published the first results, uh, these, these four planets here are the four uh, HR8799 planets that I showed in the image earlier. And they were able to recover the B and C, but not quite get down to D and E in J band, which is this plot. And uh, as this has already popped up, you can see the punchline that uh, with the post-processing that we can apply with MKIDS, we expect to be able to do uh, a factor of 100 better. There it is. Um, so that's very exciting. We should be able to push down um, to, to contrasts that are, are not really achievable with any other ground-based exoplanet imaging survey right now. Um, also very interesting, uh, this plot on the left is showing the same kind of curves, but in I-band, uh, slightly bluer wavelengths, where these planets actually have not been detected yet, as far as I know. Someone should correct me if, if they have when I wasn't watching. Uh, so these, these points are taken from atmospheric models uh, and estimated contrasts. And we see that if Project 1640 was sensitive down to these wavelengths, they would not be able to recover it. But with darkness, we think that we will be able to. So we'll be able to start putting new data points on constraining atmospheric models for uh, these large exoplanets. Next. So around the time that darkness is uh, finishing its construction and getting commissioned on the telescope, We'll also be starting work on a, on a new camera for an instrument called Picture C, which is a NASA-funded balloon-based instrument uh, that will utilize the uh, Wallops arc second pointing gondola for balloon missions developed by NASA. Uh, and it will integrate a, uh, a back-end uh, chronograph behind the telescope isn't shown here. So this is just a preliminary schematic of the chronograph that it will fly, and an MKID camera. Uh, which is scheduled for flight in 2019. It's actually a two-phase flight where the first one will just demonstrate uh, the, uh, some of the optics and pointing technology, and then the second flight will actually integrate the vector vortex chronograph and the MKID camera. So the science objectives for this mission are very similar to other current missions, uh, to image exoplanets and disks around other stars. Uh, but what's especially exciting for us is the technology objectives, which is to uh, flight demonstrate MKIDs for the first time. So this is a, a direct stepping stone for us uh, by 2019 to flight test MKIDs and bring their TRL closer to a point where we think we can put them in space. Next. Uh, because of course in space uh, is where the, the ultimate exciting result uh, will be found, which is to look for Earth analogs. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the search for other Earths is laid out in the NASA Strategic Plan Objectives, uh, just shown here, to, to understand the evolution of our solar system and uh, you know, look for the potential for life on other planets uh, around other stars. And we think that with the game-changing capabilities that MKIDS could bring to a space-based space -based Earth imaging mission, that they could really be an enabling technology to make it possible to do this kind of uh, very difficult characterization and measurement. So that is, uh, that is where we're going. Uh, this is the current status of the technology, just to summarize. Uh, the technology is functional and producing science on ground-based telescopes now. Uh, there are three new MKID instruments in development, including one to uh, demonstrate it as a flight instrument on a balloon. Uh, but the MKID arrays are still very far away from their ultimate potential. Uh, there's still a lot of room to improve the energy resolution and uh, array size and yield. Uh, so the exact numbers uh, to advance the technology will depend on the application, how big of an array you need, what wavelengths you want to work at, uh, how much we'll have to move away from the wavelengths that we're used to working at. Uh, but the, the kind of 10 to 20,000 pixel planet finding instruments that uh, we showed here are all ready now for about $1 million each.
Uh, so as, as Ben said, and you can argue with him about this, uh, this makes uh, MKIDS currently uh, one of the most powerful and capable detector technologies available. Um, and uh, of course, the major setback is that they're superconducting, so maybe not setback, but the trade-off is that uh, they require very low temperatures. However, for applications on the ground where uh, the added cost is you know, modest, uh, the, the performance improvements that they offer far outweigh that. And uh, you have to remember that in space, current and future X-ray and far infrared missions will all require similar cooling capabilities, and many of them already do. Uh, so there's a lot of synergy there uh, with, with piggybacking on that development to get MKIDs into space as well. And I think that that's it. So here's uh, some contact information and references to the papers, and we'll take questions. exciting, the MKIDs. I've been reading about them for years, and it's exciting that you've got three instruments demonstrating them um, with uh, light on the sky. Question is about your cooling. Are you currently using just helium cooling, or um, are you looking at um, other cryo coolers and then looking to see, do you have any concerns whether moving to that approach will cause drifts or other issues, noise? Sure. Yeah, we um, we're actually we're building uh, the darkness instrument is going to use a liquid helium cooler, uh, and the uh, the mech instrument is using a pulse tube cooler. Much in which our first uh, prototype instrument, Archons, also used a, a mechanical pulse tube cooler. So those are the so those both technologies work fine, and it's just a matter of size, packaging, and cost. We prefer the pulse tube coolers because you don't have to pay for the liquid helium. So um, I definitely prefer the mechanical coolers, and they they both work fine. Um, to go from, that gets you down to three or four Kelvin. To get down to our operating temperature at 100 millikelvin, we use an adiabatic demagnetization refrigerator. It's a, it's a magnetic refrigerator that, um, gets, that will get you down in a single shot or in a multi-stage method where you can stay cold if you have two of them. Um, and it's a, very, um, it's a very robust technology. It's actually TRL-9 having flown on um, Astro-E, Astro-E2. Um, so, so actually Goddard will sell you that component, the ADR, off the shelf, basically. So actually, the hard part is getting to 3 Kelvin, not getting down from 3 Kelvin. And that, um, there's um, multiple ways to do it. I mean, the, the JWST Miri cooler would do it, for instance, but it costs too much money. So um, I think that's one of the things that STMD is actually working on, is these space cryogenics, and that and we'll, we'll benefit directly from that. So most of the chain is TRL-9 already. Yeah, so what's your, what's your baseline cooling for the picture C? For the uh, it's going to be liquid helium because it's only an overnight flight. Yeah, okay. So we have, um, we actually, we actually have another balloon concept echo that's gone in uh, last year and will go in again this year that has uh, the capability to do like a 50 day long super pressure balloon flight using like a 250 liter um, giant storage doer of liquid helium and flow through cooling. So um, that, that's, pro that's possible because, you know, you have to weigh the power requirements of running the cooler versus the liquid helium cost. But um, it's, it's, it's doable. Thanks. Mike, you, you mentioned a little bit about the insensitivity to cosmic rays. Can you explain a little bit more about what you meant, why it's insensitive? And yeah, so this is an interesting thing, and, and I do think the MKIDs, we haven't tested it yet, but they should be extremely radiation hard because we make them out of a titanium nitride ceramic, which is a tool steel coating on a sapphire wafer or a silicon wafer, and we don't re rely on the semicon anything semiconducting to make this work, so they should be very rad hard. But what happens is, um, you know, a, a typical cosmic ray might, uh, might be a radioactive decay or a muon. It usually deposits energy in the crystal, and that energy is usually way more than an optical photon. It might be an MeV. And what happens is the energy, um, it gets, uh, comes out in a phonon shower, and the whole crystal kind of lights up with these phonons bouncing around, and then those bounce into other detectors nearby. So, what, so when you have a, a particle event, it, it, it may basically, it, it lights up all the pixels at the same time, and so we search in 10 microsecond bins for, um, for coincidences. So if we have more than about 10 events across the array in one 10 microsecond bin, it's a cosmic ray. And uh, we, we throw out the time interval um, around that cosmic ray. And it means that we basically throw out on the ground something like 0.01% of our exposure time. 
um, but essentially perfectly veto cosmic rays. So that, that is actually an important point for something like TPF or one of these, any, any space mission where you have to do essentially a long exposure um, like, like you would with a conventional detector on a terrestrial planet finder mission. You're gonna be, in a, you're gonna be getting bombarded by cosmic rays and you're not gonna be able to read out your detector fast enough because you have to get above the read noise in this very dark environment. And uh, the MKIDS will basically solve that problem right away. That's an additional advantage. I might have said it, I might have missed it. Um, does the MKEDS have um, any sort of crosstalk electronics issues that you, that are inherent to the design or um, it actually does better than the conventional um, um, infrared detectors? Yeah, we, um, we don't see, we, so we, we haven't tested to the level um, that like the Hawaii 2 detectors for the near infrared have been tested. So uh, there's no, but, we don't expect there to be anything equivalent to charge persistence, for instance. There, there could be thermal crosstalk between detectors, which would, won't cause you any false signals, but could slightly degrade the energy resolution that you see. Um, we, haven't, we haven't seen that yet. Uh, and, that, and I don't think it's gonna be an issue at the energy resolution of you know, 20 to 50, where we think we're gonna be. If we eventually push to you know, R of 100 or 400, sort of towards the theoretical limits at these low temperatures, then we may see more sort of thermal crosstalk issues. The electrical issues are, are, um, are, are possible, but um, we can filter a lot of that in our digital electronics, and we haven't, uh, we haven't had any problems. Uh, occasionally, if we have two resonators too close to each other, we'll lose one of the pixels, and that gives us limited yield, so we have some dead pixels in our array. It's one of the things we need to fix, but, um, but that usually just kills a pixel and doesn't give you false counts. Yeah. 